Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the, uh, our next edition of Democracy in Crisis. And um, can you hear me in the back? I don't think I need the. I don't think I need the microphone. Good in the back. Uh, today we have some distinguished guests who will speak about various aspects, various aspects of European and U.S. populism. But if you have not been to our uh, symposia before, I will go over the format very quickly. Uh, each guest will speak for 10 to 15 minutes on this topic that they have prepared. Uh, so we'll have roughly 45 minutes for all three speakers. Uh, then we will just open up for questions. And our hope is that we have a lot of participation from the audience. So please develop questions, ask them, and we have our panel of experts here who will be happy to answer them. And I'll just say that you can ask any question, even if it was not necessarily covered by our speakers. All right. Um, establish real democracy in Germany, and they say they want to have more direct democracy, like in Switzerland, meaning plebiscites. They also call for a direct election of the uh, Bundespräsident, who has less power than um, the American president. Um, they do not want a United States of Europe, which does not exist yet. Instead, they want to um, enlarge the power of the national states, they should regain or maintain their sovereignty. They are calling for a plebiscite on the euro. They are against the euro. They are also uh, against the European Central Bank. They are pro-law and order, like uh, all populist uh, movements, and call for a protection of the German borders. That means they want to end the Schengen Agreement. Schengen Agreement means that um, there is no border control within the European Union countries once you have um, entered that, uh, the first uh, European nation. They call for a limited role of NATO, only uh, defense. They do not want to establish a European Union army, which does not exist at this point. Um, they're calling for a reinstatement of military conscription, which we did away with a couple of years ago. And they're also calling for better relations with Russia. Um, they want to maintain the minimum wage, which was introduced in Germany only in 2015 and is currently around uh, $11, if you translate that into American currency. Um, they want more German children to be born instead of mass immigration. Um, they are pro-life, anti-abortion, um, which is uh, a uh, fringe opinion in, um, in Germany. Um, they are also calling for a German dominant culture, Leitkultur, instead of multiculturalism. They also say, in contrast to what uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel just said recently, that Islam does not belong to Germany. They want to get rid of public television and radio. They think that's way too liberal. And they want to maintain or reintroduce a differentiated school system. Actually, in Germany, we have three different high school degrees that, that uh, uh, are possible to get. Only with the top one are you permitted to go to university. Um, they want strict border controls, minimize immigration to a few desirables. And um, they do not want an abuse, as they call it, of asylum laws for immigration purposes. They're also calling for a simplification of income taxes. Um, they want a low top tax rate. They want to limit progressive taxation and reintroduce the banking secret, which basically means that you know people should, should be um, able, again, to uh, put their money onto Swiss bank accounts and uh, not pay taxes on it. So they're shamelessly pro-super rich, and it says so in their um, program. 
We are also opposed to renewable energy legislation, which we have had in Germany for almost 20 years, and they want to extend the lifespan of nuclear power stations. Um, the last German nuclear power station will be decommissioned in 2022. Um, here you can see the state elections in uh, Sachsen-Anhalt, that's the East German uh, state that um, I'm from, in 2016. And you can see that the AFD got 24% of the vote, um, less than the CDU, but clearly the second strongest party. And because nobody wanted to have anything to do with Linke, the left, the only option that was left was SPD, Greens, and uh, CDU to form a government. In Germany, you have to have at least 5.0% to be in parliament, and so the free liberals just kind of failed to achieve that target. Um, what, the, um, what made the AFD strong was um, the uh, situation in Germany in 2015, 2016, when over one million um, refugees came to Germany. I'm sure you've heard about that. Um, mostly from the Middle East, um, primarily uh, Syria, Afghanistan, Northern Africa, but uh, also a host of other countries. And what we did in Germany, we distributed these uh, immigrants um, according to population in the various states. So um, a uh, large, a very populous state like Nordrhein-Westfalen in the West received the largest percentage of uh, immigrants, whereas um, Sachsen-Anhalt or Mecklenburg-Vorpommern in the east received a much smaller share because the population there is much uh, smaller too. Um, in this way, uh, we want to avoid that um, you know, certain cities become focal points of immigration and that um, um, the problems with housing, etc., are too strong. Um, here you can see the foreign population in Germany before that massive influx, and uh, it's kind of self-explanatory, um, except for a few cities in East Germany. Berlin, of course, is an exception. Um, East Germany ha had uh, very low um, uh, numbers in regard to uh, immigrants. Um, the next... Uh, uh, graph sh shows a percentage, uh, only about 3% of the population in the East uh, comes from abroad, whereas in the West it's usually uh, double digits. Um, you have to keep in mind that uh, East Germany, uh, throughout most of its history, had a very low immigrant population, and the few immigrants they had, mostly from Vietnam, uh, Cuba, and uh, Angola, um, were, lived in segregated housing and had uh, very little to do with the East German population. So until 2015-16, a lot of East Germans, especially on the countryside, uh, had no contact with foreigners. And then all of a sudden the numbers doubled or tripled within 15 months. Um, yeah, next. Unfortunately, you can again see that East Germany is different from West Germany. Um, these are the um, anti-foreign crimes committed. Um, uh, and you can, you can see that uh, per 100,000 inhabitants, that the numbers are much higher in East Germany. Please do not think that we are talking about murder or, or um, serious physical harm. These are mostly propaganda. Um, uh, deeds like, for example, anti-foreign graffiti that are being sprayed and uh, similar um, propaganda uh, crimes. Again, we have, you know, we have in in still incredible differences. Uh, sachsen anhalt here with uh, 15 and compare that with Baden-Württemberg 3, so five times as much in the East. <coughs> In just last month, in August of 2018, um, a German person was, was killed by, by uh, foreigners in Chemnitz and right-wing people used that occasion 
um, with the help of smartphones, you know, to get everybody from all of East Germany and some people from West Germany together. Uh, several thousand came to Chemnitz and um, there were terrible scenes. Uh, foreigners were, were kind of hunted in the streets of, of Chemnitz. Um, there were, was an attack on a uh, Jewish restaurant in Chemnitz. And for, for whatever reason, um, the police reacted too late and the numbers, uh, they should have had uh, more police, but uh, something went wrong as so often in Sachsen. I don't know what's wrong with the state of Sachsen, but uh, a lot of problems <coughs> arrived there. Um, you can see these people, that's usually what, what right-wing fanatics, neo-Nazis look like in Germany. These are not necessarily AFD voters or sympathizers, but the, the dividing line between um, right-wing populism and right-wing extremism or neo-Nazism kind of uh, gets blurred at times. <coughs> a couple of days later, there was a um, uh, soli solidarity concert for uh, open society in Chemnitz and uh, whereas you know, three or four thousand neo-Nazis protested a few days earlier. There was uh, like 65,000 young people who uh, came to this concert, uh, punk bands and, and reggae and, uh, and rock was being played. And next, yeah, see, these were all young people and um, the neo-Nazi um, marches, uh, you have young people too, but also a lot of uh, older people. And this is kind of a similarity, I think, with other populist movements in Europe and America, that um, a lot of um, the older generation are more attracted to populism than uh, younger generation. It's also a f more a rural phenomenon than an uh, urban phenomenon. Um, so, the, um, uh, the latest polls showed that the AFD is further increasing in, um, in power. Actually, the latest poll on East Germany that I saw said that um, the AFD is the strongest political party in East Germany, with about 27 or 28 percent. Um, in the West, they usually um, get, uh, get fewer votes, perhaps about 10, 12 percent. There will be state elections in Hessen and Bayern coming up um, the next month. We will see how that uh, works out. Um, in general, I can say the AFD is nationalistic, anti-immigrant, and open to alliances with other right-wing populist parties in the European Parliament. They are also interested in developments in the USA and would like to be part of a right-wing populist international centered in Moscow. Let me emphasize this. Moscow is seriously supporting all right-wing movements in Europe, including the AFD. Um, uh, we get uh, Russia Today in its English version on, on television and in its German version on the internet. I sometimes watch this and um, they very often support, have, uh, have um, uh, reports supporting um, the AFD and other populist parties in Europe. Um, they're, they're definitely the, the mastermind behind all of this. I'm not sure how much money they get from Russia, but uh, there's definitely uh, some money there. At demonstrations, um, in, uh, in Dresden, every Monday there's demonstrations in Dresden by an organization um, kind of allied with the AFD. Uh, you see banners deploring, uh, Putin help us to enlist the Kremlin chief in support of their right-wing agenda. So um, why do we have all of this trouble so much in East Germany? Well. It's a tough question, but um, keep in mind that East Germany had been, East Germans had been living under a dictatorship for 57 years, yeah, from 1933 when the Nazis came to power until the end of 1989 when uh, the war fell in, um, uh, in Berlin. And um, after 
the wall fell in Berlin and everybody was very enthusiastic about the new times, but uh, with millions of jobs being lost, a lot of East Germans lost their enthusiasm for democracy and uh, for a united Germany and for the European Union and so on. And um, so I think that's, uh, that's one aspect. The, the long time that, that East Germans lived under a, a dictatorship. Um, but uh, in contrast to the 1990s, when um, economic misery ruled, and for example, in Sachsen-Anhalt, where, where I lived, we had an official unemployment rate in 2005 of 24%. The unofficial un unemployment rate was more like 42%. Um, now unemployment is basically gone. We have 7.5% in Sachsen-Anhalt. In some other states, East German states, it's under 5%. Um, economic situation is really good, so that is not an excuse. So um, at the same time when unemployment went down, the economy went up. That's the, also the time when the AFD um, increased uh, their uh, power in society. And the real danger I see is that um, the AFD is kind of you know, moving the goalposts. The AFD talks about topics that are being taken up, especially by the CDU and the CSU, the Bavarian <clears throat> version of the CDU. And uh, so the entire German political um, discussion kind of moves and shifts toward the right. Just last week, um, a positive thing happened. Um, the police in Sachsen finally did something uh, uh, good. Um, they arrested eight people who they charged with terrorism. These eight um, um, neo-Nazi sympathizers wanted to get themselves semi-automatic guns, which they have not succeeded, which they did not succeed in getting, and wanted to attack uh, journalists, um, hostile politicians, and foreigners on October 3rd, yesterday, the day of uh, German unity. Um, but now these guys are in prison and um, they will probably stay there for a long time because the terrorism charge is a very serious one. And um, um, the, um, the only way I believe to deal with um, um, right-wing populism is a very st st strong and um, serious response by our um, um, state authorities, uh, by the police, by the courts, and also of civil society. Because um, this combination, civil society and um, the, the authorities will hopefully um, succeed in um, killing or in, in at least uh, diminishing the negative impact that um, these uh, populists uh, have on German society and of course also on Germany's uh, image in the world. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Martin Nicola. I'm a historian and political scientist from the Czech Republic. Uh, don't worry, the zombies are not coming. I just slept just uh, two hours before because my flight was delayed. So if I fall asleep during my talk, then don't hesitate to stab me with a pen or something. Um, I would like to focus my lecture primarily on the Czech Republic, the country I come from. Uh, thanks to its strategic position right in the heart of Europe, it has always been a meeting point, you know, a center of business and, uh, and culture, and a place where the West met uh, the East. Uh, today, it has one of the lowest unemployment rates in Europe, uh, its economy is growing, uh, the quality of life is very high, but still, we Czechs have been uh, labeled troublemakers and uh, inside aggregators or an inner opposition within the uh, European Union because of our resistance to the plan of receiving refugees from uh, Middle East and, uh, and Africa, and uh, I would say this is just the uh, top of the iceberg, right? Because a general tension within the EU, uh, which has lasted for some years now, uh, has also led to a rise of populism, uh, which I consider one of the very serious threats to liberal uh, democracy. So I would I would uh, talk about this uh, more in uh, detail. Uh, actually, one year ago, in October 2017, we had uh, the uh, parliamentary election in the Czech Republic which brought an increase um, in power to three protest or anti-establishment uh, political parties. 
the Pirate Party, uh, the anti-European party called uh, Freedom and Democracy, and the party called ANO. ANO means yes in Czech, but also is a short form of the uh, uh, Association of Dissatisfied Citizens. Uh, so you can see it's a clear uh, anti-establishment and uh, protest. Uh, not even party, it's a movement. Uh, founded by a billionaire, Andrei Babish, uh, the second wealthiest man in, in the Czech Republic and also a man suspected of uh, massive corruption. Uh, and this guy later uh, became uh, prime minister. Uh, something tells me that uh, you have some experience with the crook billionaires in charge as well, right, in the United States? Uh, well, uh, the Czech Republic, also officially called Czechia, uh, is a, a small country in Central Europe with about 10.5 million uh, people with its economy strongly tied to the larger German economy uh, and with uh, most of its foreign trade uh, with other uh, member countries of the European Union. Uh, Czechia has been a stable member of the EU since 2004 and uh, made a great step forward thanks to it and then benefit from, from the membership. Uh, so there is no real alternative you know, for us um, other than a deepening integration uh, with the EU. However, the Euroscepticism has dramatically increased in the past few years. Uh, we usually distinguish between hard and uh, soft Euroscepticism. Uh, hard Euroscepticism uh, refers to a complete rejection of um, EU membership, hand in hand with the um, uh, rejection of NATO. While soft Euroskeptics uh, support just a limited uh, EU membership, uh, but are critical of various aspects of integration such as the cross-border movement of people, uh, like the, the Schengen system, uh, my colleague mentioned, uh, such as the adoption of the common uh, currency, Euro. Uh, the Czech currency, Koruna, still continues. Uh, um, and we, we didn't adopt the uh, Euro and we, we hesitate to, to do it. But the main issue is, uh, let's say, giving up powers and responsibilities of the local, meaning state government, in favor of a supranational <coughs> leadership in, in Brussels. Uh, the European Commission, uh, the European Parliament, and other EU uh, institutions. I say that I would say that uh, the current situation in the Czech Republic, um, in many ways, reflects the, the past. Uh, if you have some background in history, you probably know that uh, uh, the Czech Republic was, you know, under uh, the German slash Austrian rule for more than uh, 300 years, and. Uh, many Czechs see their national identity as having been defined from outside. Uh, the criticism of the European Union brings up this uh, historical threat of, of uh, collaboration and the three historical periods in which the, the Czech lands were under the rule of uh, foreign power and the Czechs had to make uh, concessions to survive. Uh, I mean the long period under the Austrian Empire, then the uh, Nazi occupation during the World War II, and the uh, Soviet um, or Russian supremacy between 1948 and uh, 1989. Uh, so this is reflected in many criticism of the European Union that depict the Czech Republic as a pawn uh, controlled by, by the West. Uh, thus the EU um, encroachment on domestic issues is seen by many Czechs um, as clear evidence of a foreign rule. Uh, there is a feeling of uh, lost sovereignty uh, as a result of EU membership, and um, Euroscepticism symbolically reasserts lost uh, autonomy. Uh, by its very definition, membership uh, of the EU means that uh, any member state will have to give up uh, you know, certain aspects of self-governance in order um, uh, to fully participate. So the Eurosceptics are able to tap into these nationalistic sentiments in order to gain support for their cause, whether or not the loss of sovereignty is real or just imagined. There are many factors that may influence the growth of Euroscepticism, but one of the most significant ones is the expansion of the EU's authority into domestic matters. Uh, critics have said that uh, there is a, democracy, a democratic deficit um, in the governing of the EU, that the decision-making processes in Brussels uh, are too distant, too strange, you know, too complicated, that the EU leaders are not um, responsible for the de decisions to check voters and, and the public. Uh, the, there is a European Parliament and the elections held every five years 
have almost no consequence and, and are treated with indifference. Uh, the Czech Republic has, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 21 uh, seats out of 751 in, in, in the European Parliament. And the turnout um, at the last EU elections in May 2014 was less than 90%, you know, so less than one-fifth of uh, all eligible voters. Uh, so this was in fact the second lowest uh, turnout among uh, the uh, EU states. So the EU bureaucracy, um, inefficiency, disrespect towards the opinion, feelings and the needs of the people in the member states, and the fact that European law overrides the, the Czech constitution and the Czech laws in many cases have been criticized by all parties across uh, the, the Czech political scene for past, let's say, 13 years. Um, but recently there have been uh, two issues that made Euroscepticism uh, a mainstream uh, and uh, a serious burning topic on a, a daily basis. Uh, you probably know that in the referendum in Great Britain held in uh, uh, June 2016, 51.9% uh, of electorate voted to leave the European Union. Uh, that was a shattering blow. You know, the, the, the processes leading to uh, total Brexit have commenced, and uh, in March 2019, probably uh, Great Britain uh, won't be uh, an EU member anymore. Although there are still debates about setting up a new referendum and uh, about the repeal of the results of the first one, because it uh, showed up how complicated it, it uh, would be uh, to, to separate Great Britain economically and, and polit politically uh, from, from the rest of the uh, European <coughs> Union. So no one expected the result of the first referendum and it was a clear warning you know, for, uh, for the EU and uh, to the EU elites uh, that the Union needed um, immediate reforms. Uh, the Czech Republic, I would say, needs to be or should be in the middle of, of these changes for better um, and uh, the building of a new EU vision because it's a win-win solution. Uh, we can show, I mean, we Czechs as a nation that we are uh, creative, active, uh, respectful to our partners and uh, not merely the ones who criticize constantly, who, who don't care, sit in the back, uh, let the others uh, do the work and shout only when, when we don't like uh, something. Uh, some EU critics among Czech politicians called for a similar uh, referendum, preferably leading to a Czech exit, uh, but it is, it's, uh, it's highly unlikely, you know, because there is no other alternative uh, uh, that the EU and, uh, as I said, Czechs benefit uh, greatly from the European single market uh, and the EU structural and investment funds. We have drawn billions of euros uh, from these arrangements in past 14, 15 years uh, of our membership so that uh, we could build you know, highways and roads, protect the environment, uh, renovate cities, uh, modernize industry, uh, allow our students to get university degrees in Western Europe at prestigious Western European universities, etc., etc. But still, uh, more and more people are calling for um, Chexit. Why? Uh, we have to look um, at this trend uh, from a broader perspective, uh, and we see that the rejection of the EU and uh, common European values uh, is, uh, are closely tied to the uh, populism. Uh, political parties lacking any ideological foundation or background and uh, using populist uh, appeals um, uh, emerged in Central and Eastern Europe in general since the end of 1990s. Uh, these parties did not adopt uh, radical uh, ideology, although uh, substituting uh, for it uh, an, an um, anti-political appeal, uh, speaking in that case about the, the, the Czech Republic. Until 2009, 2010, uh, populism was not a prominent element in um, Czech politics, meaning mostly political parties uh, at the periphery of the political spectrum used some uh, populist uh, rhetorics. Compared to other Central and Eastern European democracies, uh, Czechia had one of the most stable and relatively closed uh, party systems, which was uh, characterized by uh, almost uh, exclusive uh, unidimensional uh, competition. But then, you know, the, the new generation of voters grew up, uh, and these people seem to be characterized by a lower level of identification with uh, the traditional left-wing, centrist, or right-wing parties. And uh, 
there is a tendency to be attracted instead by you know, simplified populist promises and therefore to be linked with the new protest or anti-establishment uh, uh, movements and uh, parties. These political entities usually divide the society into two antagonist groups, uh, the pure people, like the good guys, and the, the corrupt um, uh, elites. Uh, they argue that uh, politics should be an expression of a general will of the people. Uh, they emphasize a real or an imaginary uh, crisis or threat. They claim to speak uh, for the, the good and honest people and attack the uh, out-of-touch and mainstream um, elites. Uh, you certainly remember that uh, your great supreme leader has often used the claim draining the swamp in DC uh, during uh, his campaign. So I guess this is, uh, this is similar in, in the US um, uh, as well. Uh, as I mentioned, it is often problematic to identify these parties and movements on the left-right political spectrum because they often combine uh, elements from both uh, ends of the spectrum. Uh, combined with this populist uh, language. Uh, there is also an important role of uh, charismatic leaders or uh, rhetorical features such as you know, tabloid style, uh, dramatization and uh, the, the use of social media uh, and also to, to spread the, the, the fake news. If we take a look in general at the populism um, uh, from the European perspective, uh, we see that populists have established themselves as powerful political force and have become integral members of coalition governments in Italy, in, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Finland, and uh, my colleague uh, spoke about the, the alternative for Germany. So the uh, importance and the influence of these parties uh, is gr exponentially uh, growing in, uh, uh, as a reaction uh, to the politics of uh, the uh, European uh, Union elites. Uh, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, and Hungary, uh, you know, the countries in Central Europe, uh, uh, maintain closer relations uh, uh, than uh, with the rest of Europe uh, through a local alliance called Visegrad 4 or V4. And in recent years, each one of them has had to deal uh, with increasing populism more or less connected with uh, negativism, you know, focused either on corruption, the heritage of communism, uh, dissatisfaction uh, with developments after uh, the, the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1989, uh, and also dis uh, dissatisfaction with the, the economic transition and uh, the political transition to uh, democracy. Uh, again, the EU factor plays a significant role in this, like uh, the national interests uh, versus Brussels uh, directives, and people from countries from uh, former Soviet bloc, including uh, uh, these four countries I mentioned, are actually very sensitive uh, about pressure from outside. Uh, I've already talked about the feeling of German dominance, you know, in the in the Czech case, uh, but here is another similar comparison. For more than 40 years, um, um, following the the end of the World War II, the communist regimes of uh, Central Europe including the one in Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, uh, received strategic decisions from uh, Moscow alone, you know, from the Soviet Union. Uh, official propaganda talked about the Soviets as liberators, protectors, uh, great friends, uh, equal partners. But in fact, uh, the countries were nothing more than satellites and just subordinated uh, vassals of the uh, Soviet Union. And these uh, <coughs> political regimes, so-called people's democracies, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe were far from any uh, participation um, uh, or involvement um, uh, by their citizens in decision uh, making. There was an old joke, uh, um, Perga in the official propaganda, which said that the citizens fully supported uh, the ruling Communist Party and its uh, endeavors, but the people didn't uh, give a damn about it. So that was a, you know, the, the real situation. Um, and uh, the, the gap or the, the uh, deep abyss between the, the elites and uh, the citizens and the people. Uh, that nicely depicts the widespread mood in society in late 1980s when the rules were so distant uh, from uh, the dominated, <coughs> dominated citizens. Uh, so I guess that the current situation and, and the abyss of misunderstanding between Brussels, uh, meaning the European leaders and the individual member countries and their citizens uh, remind uh, one these, these uh, old times. Uh, 
Another issue that revealed Czech, Slovak, Polish, and Hungarian dissatisfaction with the European Union has been the so-called uh, European refugee crisis. This is a term given to a period between beginning in, 19, uh, in uh, 2015 when rising number of uh, people, uh, I think it's less than two million so far, uh, arrived in the European Union, uh, traveling across the Mediterranean Sea or overland uh, through South um, East Europe. So these people uh, included uh, asylum seekers from the countries really hit by armed conflicts such as Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, but also others, and I would say there was a larger group, uh, labeled as economic migrants, you know, from Black Africa, from Southeastern Asia. Uh, and uh, although most of these people headed to Germany, to Sweden, or to Great Britain, uh, which showed the most, let's say, open, welcoming uh, policy, uh, the European Union, uh, in uh, an attempt to deal with the mass uh, migration influx, decided on a mandatory quota for relocation of um, asylum seekers for all the member countries. The Czech Republic was um, required to accept, on the basis on these quotas, about uh, 3,000 refugees, but our government reacted with a strong disapproval uh, to these decisions, again, coming from outside, from Brussels, and uh, the <coughs> European Union, instead of dialogue, uh, threatened not just Czechia, but all we four countries with uh, punishment for their uh, disobedience, obstruction, and uh, lack of solidarity. And in late 2017, last year, <coughs> the EU stated that member states who refuse participation in the quota system could be expected to pay the sum of about uh, 250,000 euros, meaning about $290,000 uh, for each assigned uh, uh, asylum seeker they refuse. So you can imagine that this really uh, doesn't help, you know, to, uh, for some better uh, relations within, within the EU. Uh, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I'm afraid that the Czech Republic might, easily, uh, might be easily pulled down uh, into the vortex and move uh, towards totalitarian quasi-democracy like uh, its neighbors. Uh, you probably know about the latest developments in Hungary under the Prime Minister Orban. Uh, there is an ultra-conservative party Prawo um, i uh, in Poland. Uh, so uh, I don't see uh, the, the future in very uh, bright colors uh, because with the oligarch billionaire as a prime minister and a president who is also a populist playing with the constitution as it suits him, uh, this unpleasant image isn't too far from reality, I'm afraid. Thank you. Hear me okay? So, what I wanted to talk today, louder, uh, what I wanted to talk about today was given these conditions that we've been talking about with these rise of these, these populist parties uh, with their demands in, in Europe and to some degree in the United States, what can a liberal democracy do or what conditions can a liberal democracy uh, set up, and particularly with its institutions, um, to try and limit the effect of populism and uh, maybe channel it uh, to some degree. Uh, and, you know, I apologize if some of this gets in a little sort of insider baseballish or soccer. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's the rules and the institutions that, that, that do make a difference. I mean, I thought it was interesting that one of the first things you said about AFD was they wanted a directly elected president uh, and they wanted the institution of referendums. Both of those are political institutions that tend to help populist parties. Uh, the list of countries that you gave uh, a minute ago where populism has achieved some level of success, if you look, all of those political systems have to some degree or another a system of proportional representation uh, in their, their electoral rules. Uh, that is something that also tends, I would argue, to foster uh, or, or provide more opportunities, maybe that's a better way, <coughs> excuse me, putting it, uh, for uh, populist parties. Um, so, you know, there's a balance and a mix. Now, you know, none of this is perfect. Uh, there's no right solution. Um, populism uh, has a lot of different sources, right? They're, 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 they're all the issues that we've talked about here, concerns over uh, immigration from the Middle East crisis, foreign meddling in, 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 your, in your government, 
Uh, in the United States, there's a particular emphasis on the perception of the inequality in the economic system, uh, corruption, uh, and you know, some of these grievances are overblown perhaps. Some of them are arguably very real. I and mean, if you're an Italian citizen complaining about corruption in the Italian government, I don't think anybody can really argue with you. Uh, the question is, and this is always a problem with populism, as, as I read somewhere recently, it's very good at identifying problems. It's just that it's very bad at coming up with solutions, or it comes up with, at least from a liberal democratic point of view, very bad solutions. So the question is, how do you deal with that, right? Real grievances, uh, without giving in to sort of the worst excesses that, that populism can, can contain. Um, you know, if you, if you suppress it, you just make it worse. I, I think to some degree, I mean, it's one thing to crack down on violent activism and so forth, the terrorist uh, arrests you were talking about. Um, but if you sort of ignore the real grievances that, that pop voters who are attracted to populism have, um, you know, you, you, you feed their own narrative, right? The elites ignoring you uh, and so forth. Um, so I, I would argue that if, if you look at the different political institutions, and particularly the electoral institutions, there are certain ones that are more problematic in terms of dealing with a uh, uh, populist political movement. And uh, I think the biggest two, I mean, there's I actually have a fairly lengthy list, but you know, time constraints. Uh, I think the biggest two are the presence of proportional representation electoral systems. Uh, and also, and, and this is perhaps more relevant to the American example, presidential-based systems as opposed to parliamentary. Um, not that either set of alternatives to that is a guarantee, but in terms of likelihood. If you look in um, proportional systems, right, so what we mean by that is an electoral system where if you get, you know, 6% of the vote, you get 6% of the seats in the legislature as opposed to what we have in the United States, what we have in Great Britain, what we have in France, uh, where you have a political system where you have to win a seat in a single district, right? A single seat in a district, which means one party wins, even though they may not even have a majority of votes, they just have to come in first, and everybody else gets nothing. Right? Now the problem with that system, the single member system that we use, is that it's anti-democratic to a degree. Right? Somebody wins an election with 40% of the votes, 60% of the population are out of luck. And that's always been the greatest criticism of single member systems. And in times when populism is at a really low, relatively low ebb, uh, you know, kinder, gentler de democratic times, if you will, Europe in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, that makes it an attractive alternative to the sorts of system we have in the United States, which seems anti-democratic. But when you get a spike in populist uh, support, populist parties, uh, proportional systems provide them a, a way to get into the political system that they would not be afforded in a single member district system. Um, and I, I think you really can see that when you look at the elections, in, especially in Europe, uh, over the last few years. Um, you had a, a statistic up there, I think, that showed the, uh, the AFD with 12% of the vote in the last election, which translates roughly into about 12% of the seats in the German parliament. You know, for a party that, has been on, the, that is on the extreme edge, um, this is a golden opportunity, right? You, you are suddenly not a, a, a group of you know, extremists out on the street or the beer hall or whatever, you know, wherever it might be, uh, preaching, you know, sort of hateful ideas to, you know, suddenly you're members of parliament, you're members of the Bundestag, you have a certain respectability, you have a much more elevated platform, and it can allow you to build on that level of political support uh, and become attractive to voters who might not have considered you before. The reason I thought it was interesting with the AFD, with the 12%, is not in the last election, but the, the election before that in Great Britain, the UK Independence Party, UKIP, had almost the identical results, about 12, per, 12 to 13 percent popular vote. Uh, and it won them all of the grand total of one seat in the House of Commons, right? Way below one percent, is 650 uh, MPs, right? The, and that, you know, deprives them of, their, of, of oxygen to some degree. 
Uh, it leaves them out of the political system. It denies them a certain platform, a certain respectability. Uh, their PR system would otherwise give them. Uh, and in fact, their support has dropped en enormously uh, since then. And it acts as a disincentive for voters, right? If you are a voter who is somewhat attracted by a populist message in a system with proportional representation, well, then vote for them, right? Because heck, even if they get six or seven percent of the vote, they're going to have a bunch of members of parliament who might be able to make a difference. Maybe they can use their votes as leverage with the other parties and, and, and those sorts of things. They, they can make political progress. In a system like you have in the UK, or like we have here, you vote for one of those smaller parties, they get 6%, they get 12%, they get nothing. You've, in a sense, you've wasted your vote. Uh, now, if you're totally disgusted with a system, that might lead you to drop out completely and not vote. Democratically, maybe that's not a great thing. But in terms of limiting the effect of populism, there's a benefit to that. Uh, or, alternatively, you'll make the decision that my vote for that populist party is a waste. I'm going to go with one of the mainstream parties who has a chance to win. I may be voting between what I, as a voter, perceive as the lesser of two evils, but at least I'll get the lesser of two evils, or at least a chance uh, at that. I think that's a really important distinction between the two systems. Now, you know, certainly in a single member system like you know, like I've been talking about, there is a chance that the bigger parties may say, well, we got to accommodate these populists to some degree, otherwise we'll lose enough votes that the other big party will beat us. Uh, you know, Republicans will need to accommodate it, or the Democrats will beat them if they don't, that kind of logic. There's some truth to that. And it may mean that some aspects of populism work their way into the political platforms of the bigger or mainstream parties. Depending on your view of those, that may be a bad thing. But I would argue it's a better alternative than to have the populace injecting their views and their more extreme policies and answers to these questions, sort of unfiltered or unaltered uh, by a bigger party with a broader level of, of support. Uh, to use a British example, it's one thing to have Theresa May's conservative government uh, talk about you know, we're going to tighten up immigration laws and uh, we're going to be pay more attention to those communities left behind than having somebody, you know, a sort of British equivalent of, of the AFD with much, much harsher, much more strident and extreme uh, <laughs> policies. Another problem for proportional systems is that they, um, because they tend to have multiple parties, the non-populist parties, when they're dealing with a rising populist party, are you know are divided, right? They are the, you know look at the you know you had the election in Sweden the other day, right? And the populist party, the Swedish Democrats, I believe they're called, uh, you know they got something like 12, 15 percent of the vote. None of the other bigger non-populist parties got enough votes to form a government. So now they, and they said, well, we're not going to do a deal with the Swedish Democrats, but then that means they have to deal across the aisle with each other, which is politically very difficult. Uh, it makes it difficult for them to respond to a populist uh, rising party. And to the extent that they stitch something together, the populists can say, look, the elite are ganging up against us. They're trying to keep the true people down. Um, you know, the same thing essentially is going on in a, in, a, in, a, in a system where you have bigger, broader parties in a single member district. Uh, system, but it's not so open. There is a greater coordination of response. Uh, it, it limits, again, the opportunities for a populist party in a parliament to sort of stir up trouble, if you will. So, I mean, again, you know, if you look at the, the, the countries that we've talked about here as being examples of populist success, all the countries with the proportional system. If you look at, you know, Great Britain, France, <coughs> Uh, these are systems where populist parties have largely failed. Uh, they have not been able to crack their way into political power. Uh, you know, UKIP has had you know, some success in forcing a referendum, but that's about it. Uh, the National Front in France made a big splash, right? But they lost the presidential election, and they have, I believe, eight out of 577 seats in the French Parliament, in the, in the National Assembly. That's nothing in terms of political support. Uh, and that doesn't give them much ground to, 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 to territory to make ground with, if you, if you follow what I mean. So I, I would argue that, you know, 
single member systems and sort of, you know, they're kind of out of vogue in some ways as they're seen as anti-democratic. There's nothing new about this idea that proportional representation helps populist parties. It just kind of subsided in importance and recognition when there weren't any populist parties on the stage. Uh, but now that they have sort of returned for various reasons in different societies, um, I, I think the, you know, the importance of non-proportional systems as perhaps one part of the solution uh, is more noteworthy. Um, the other big institution I think that, that helps uh, populist parties, and this is the one that is more relevant to the United States, is a presidential system. Uh, when you can have an office that is independently elected, where you can come as a political outsider, say, I'm not part of that corrupt elite, um, whether you may have been or not, uh, up till that point, if you can portray yourself as an outsider and you can, and you can, you know, you can latch onto these populist messages and, 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 and you know, uh, advance them with, uh, you know, presumably some level of political charisma, um, that makes the system more vulnerable to a populist takeover. Uh, we certainly see this in Latin America uh, quite often. Um, but it's still, I, I still would argue it's, it, it's less of a danger than, than a proportional electoral system. And if you combine a presidential election with a system that is non-proportional, it can limit the damage, if you will. You know, one, one of Marie Le Pen's problems was she wasn't going to have much parliamentary support even if she got uh, elected. You know, we've seen populist candidates in the United States before. Uh, George Wallace in the 1960s, Ross Perot in the 1980s. Neither of them were really able to launch themselves beyond making some splashy headlines and, and, and you know, a chunk of the vote that didn't matter. What was, you know, Donald Trump himself, to the extent that he is a populist candidate, you know, he flirted with running earlier as an independent. He got nowhere. He abandoned it. It's worth pointing out that to the extent that he is a populist, he was only able to get into office running under the banner of one of the big mainstream parties. If you don't like Donald Trump's pop, you know, positions and his populism, that's a bad thing, sure. But I would argue it is, you know, when we, we see it play out, the idea of sort of, you know, resistance within the government and, you know, the fact that he can't get a lot of legislation through Congress, that this is a populist who is constrained uh, in part by the institutional rules of our system that checks and balances, but also in part by the fact that he needs the support and the cooperation of a large, much broader tent uh, political party, which is the sort of party you're likely to get uh, when you have a single member system. It's also worth pointing out, and this is kind of an oddity about the American political system, you know, populists do not usually represent the majority. They, they portray themselves as being majoritarian. Very rarely, right, in, in, any of those, in any of these political systems, even the ones where they've been the most successful, do they at least initially represent majority opinion. Um, you know, and that, is true with Donald Trump, right? He did not have majority support. Uh, one of the ironic features of our election is we have a, in the Electoral College an electoral institution that's designed to some degree to limit majoritarianism, but it was designed for the 18th century, uh, a different time, a different place, uh, and actually in this election it actually gave the populist candidate to some degree an advantage. Right? It is, you know, it's, it's worth noting that he lost the popular election. If we had an electoral presidential system like France, he wouldn't be president. And we probably would have been talking about, wow, there was a surge of populism that was unsuccessful in the United States in the 2016 uh, election. Uh, he gained from a sort of skewed set of, of electoral rules designed for a different, I would argue, a different time and era. So, you know, again, I, sorry, I know this gets kind of technical at times and stuff, but it's this idea that, you know, the electoral rules matter. Now, you can change these, you're still going to have populism. And again, I would argue you can't ignore populism, right? It represents real grievances, real issues. Um, but if you want to restrain it uh, in the political system, you need to have some sort of institutions that can that can channel it or, or dampen it down. You don't want to go too far, otherwise, you know, you, you trigger a bigger backlash. Uh, there's a lot of different institutions that can do that. Some of them are institutional checks and balances, but those, of course, can feed into the narrative that the elites repressing the majority. Electoral systems, I would argue, are a better institution for doing it. 
because they allow people to participate, they allow people to vote, but they limit the, the representation and therefore one could argue the damage that populist parties uh, are able to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll open up for questions or comments. So uh, apologies if this, if this is a simple question, but it's just it's interesting how universal populism seems to be. Whereas if you look at the political parties in America and compare them to Europe, there are some similarities, but there's also a lot of differences. So I was just wondering what allows populism to be so universal? Is it the immigration issues of today? Is there some defining characteristic, maybe? <laughs> I think nobody knows the answer to that question, unless somebody wants to try. Um, I think, I think um, the immigration issue is definitely there. But I also think that um, you know, microelectronics, entire development, smartphones, etc. You know this better than I do. Um, has also led to a lot of insecurity, especially among older people who are not capable of dealing with the technology. Those who only have a high school degree. And I think it's this combination. Yeah, also the phenomenon of direct democracy and uh, uh, referendum, as, as uh, your colleague mentioned. Uh, for example, Czech populists still see the, the Swiss model, you know, uh, where the referendums are held every two weeks on a local level uh, in each canton, meaning each region of Switzerland, and the people just can decide about everything, you know, what should be built, what should be renovated, uh, what should be bought, and the populists say that's the way. But on the other hand, uh, the Swiss citizens are seem to be overwhelmed by the democracy, you know, and by, by the possibility to, to decide whether they want. They just they, they don't like it, like it anymore. They received emails with the links. You know now you can um, um, uh, take part in the in, in the poll or in the, in the referendum, uh, but they are fooled. You know, so I, I think that it's not not a, not a way. And yeah, the uh, social media uh, as well is a very important uh, part of it. Right. One thing that's social media allows you to do is bypass traditional elite institutions in journalism and uh, traditional media like television, right? So people can communicate directly with each other about various things of interest to them, which didn't exist before 2000 and whatever. But Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, you, you might have had these, these, these angers over issues and grievances, but you were sort of contained in your own little bubble. You didn't realize how many people shared your narrative and, and so forth. You know, I, I think, you know, like I said, I think economic inequality, which to some degree, globalization, the, the, the rise of information technology, um, autom you know, automation, you know, has all sort of fed into. Uh, that's one thing that feeds into populism. Immigration, the sense of your, your, you know, your identity is being challenged. I, I, I spent a while, uh, two summers ago, with a lot of uh, Brits, and I started sort of pumping them, you know, well, did you vote for Brexit? Why, why did you vote for it? And I lost track, literally, of the number of times the conversation started with, I'm not a racist, but, right, which yeah, usually means something else. But, but the point being, though, but it was that sense they had that, you know, my, my community's not what it was. Uh, it's changed. I don't hear English on the street spoken. Uh, the, the people are different. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot that you could argue is wrong with that attitude, but it is a real, it's a real sense of disorientation. Um, this is feeling the system is rigged against you. So then you go through these different countries that we've all talked about: Britain, France, Brit, you know, the United States, Germany, and it's a different mix of those things, right? Obviously, for Germany, the the, the, the Middle East refugee crisis is probably a bigger driving thing. The inequality, economic, I think, is a bigger thing here in the United States. But it's the same sort of cocktail ingredients, and, and then that sort of determines the specifics of the populism, I, I would say, in each country. Ken, did you have a question? Um, it kind of goes for you two both, actually. Um, you talked about how the Czech Republic clearly saw benefits from the EU, and they saw growth economically, and unemployment rates went down. Do younger Czechs who are, tend to be more populist, do they see that as a Czech achievement more so than a European achievement? And does that feed into populism at all? Because I feel like the EU definitely provided some of that success for both countries. But as a younger person who doesn't necessarily have a recollection of that, 
it's harder to associate with the EU than it is to associate with like a nationalist sort of view. Yeah, also the younger generations uh, don't have the experience uh, with the life under communism, uh, you know. So they think everything is automatic, like the democracy, like the freedom of speech, like the, the you can travel abroad without any limits. Uh, that's that's very important. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, as I said, there is a very low turnout in the European election, but also in the Senate election. You have two chambers, like the, the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. Uh, it's the same thing, like uh, 20, 25 percent uh, of the turnout of, um, of the voters. So younger people don't really care about uh, uh, the politics uh, at all, and that's, that's the problem. So I think that uh, for near future, um, the participative processes might be a, a, a solution, you know, to, to get the people involved on a local level. In the cities, you know, uh, the decision making. I don't know if you're ever of the, of the concept of participatory budgeting, uh, you know, uh, it's quite popular here in the US, right? New York City has it, Chicago has it, uh, the city of Vallejo near San Francisco uh, has developed it in, in the last uh, few years, and this is becoming popular in the Czech Republic, right? In the bigger cities, even in the smaller towns, just the people really see how the, and the municipality works. Uh, they become the partners of the, uh, of the mayors or of the city councils, you know. They know that uh, where, where the money comes from. Uh, so I think that this, is, this might be a, a solution to, to raise a bit the, the interest of, of the younger generations and political life in general. I think that's a very important point that, that, that you're making there. Um, you know, when, when all of this happened, when all these people came, um, a lot of um, Germans vol volunteered to help, yeah? I think the total number was like 10 million. Um, in East Germany, though, um, the numbers were, were much, much uh, smaller. And uh, in the village where I live, we, we organized a um, kind of a club that um, uh, helped, uh, you know, teach German, and uh, uh, get bicycles fixed so everybody could have a bicycle and uh, have a, a Sunday afternoon session for, for the women and so on. And um, we found out after a short time that all those who were teaching were all West Germans who had moved to East Germany. Yeah? And um, in East Germany, a lot of more people would have been needed. In West Germany, they sent people away and said, you know, we don't really need you, we have, we have more than enough people. Um, there, are certainly, there is certainly a, a crime element there, yes. Um, but if you look at the large numbers, for example, of Syrians and, and uh, people from Afghanistan, um, the, the crime rate is, is, is uh, about the same rate as among the German population. But the thing is, spectacular crimes happen, and those, of course, are being reported and perhaps even over-reported. One thing I noticed, and this is a statistical um, um, thing, um, People from certain areas of northern, northern Africa, like Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, 
um, there seems to be a relatively high tendency comparative to, to other nations uh, of crime you know, that, that, that exists. And uh, unfortunately, um, those, those people who uh, do engage in crime, and then it's not just one or two crimes, but 20, 50, 60, you know, one person, and nothing much happens. Of course, it gets, gets a lot of people angry. And um, we have to come to terms with, we have to find a way to really um, punish uh, the people who completely and totally misbehave uh, uh, in, in a real way. Otherwise, we will have a lot more people who will see, you know, what's, what's happening with some people and that there is no, no punishment and uh, that, of course, further uh, um, increases the threat of uh, more people falling into the hands of the populists. You know, the crimes committed by the uh, refugees um, are not a real issue because we have only 12 official refugees in the Czech Republic from the Middle East. I can name all of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, and majority of the population would like to stay untouched, you know, uh, by, by the influx of non-European foreigners. Uh, some politicians repeatedly uh, warned the public against uh, unreasonable xenophobia and hatred uh, for Muslims, but the president and the prime minister uh, emphasized the issue such as the spread of infectious disease, uh, uh, terrorism, and the formation of ghettos and isolated Muslim communities uh, as a consequence of accepting refugees. Uh, and also today when the, the it's, it's the power of media that shapes the, the views of the public on various issues, the images from burning uh, cities like London, Paris, and Berlin, and, and Brussels, uh, which were hit by the terrorist attacks in past years, really don't you know, help to, to promote an objective, professional debate. Um, so unfortunately, now it's really the, the populist statements and uh, partial radical short-term solutions, and also calling for an um, isolationist <laughs> approach. Uh, towards the EU and, and uh, towards the whole uh, refugee um, issue, unfortunately. Is there a correlation between um, decreasing voter turnouts and a rise in populism? Uh, it seems like, uh, as we see the public, uh, voting turnout um, increase in the United States, it seems like we're seeing more extreme split between the two sides of the political spectrum. Well, actually, um, in Germany, um, voter participation and interest in politics has increased. Same phenomenon we had during the Weimar Republic, where uh, a huge participation in politics did not mean sane and, and healthy political surroundings. Well, I would just point out that, you know, in Britain, where you've got less of this populist movement in part, Voter turnout tends to be lower than in the rest of the continent. Uh, so I don't think there's any easy relationship there. And I, and I do think, you know, when you get people who get fired up and start participating, perhaps for the first time or the first time in a long time in elections, probably means their answer, there's something about that populist message that appeals. So if there is a correlation, I suspect it, sort of as you're saying, it might very well run the other way. Oh, Somebody so, hasn't asked a question. Yes. So did Andre Babish, uh, did he, his opponent, did he support joining the Euro in the last election, or did he not support joining the Euro? No. Don't have, a, have a note. Um, Is Viktor Orban um, just like Andre Babish, or is he, um, or is Andre Babish more like a uh, more pro-European? Would you say? Uh. Well, Andrei Andre Babish uh, wants to focus himself just on the Czech matters, while uh, um, Viktor Orban seems to be more oriented on a more broader European level. Uh, there is another European election um, in uh, May 2019, and uh, Orban is trying to uh, concentrate the like-minded you know, counterparts, like the populist uh, leaders and populist parties from all European countries, uh, just to, to defeat the, the ruling uh, liberal slash social uh, democratic uh, le leadership of the European Union, and uh, uh, he wants to um, win the, the next European election uh, next year with with his allies uh, and to you know to switch or to, to, to change the, the political views of the whole European Union. So we'll see. commentary that I would just like to hear like your thoughts on that the reason why American um, 
culture or ideology changes so much more slowly, like including like our rise of populism is a little slower, is because there's just so many more of us. Like for, it would take much longer, I guess, for that many our, our percentage of the population uh, to become populist for it to have an effect. Like, do you think it could just be a size of the population, or it'd be more of like our multi-plurality uh, or culture? Does that make sense? Yes, okay. but here's what I'm, I'll answer to start a stab at this. And I would say that uh, populism is not new in America it's since at least the 1960s. Uh, it's just been hidden by the two-party system. And uh, as uh, Dr. Davies mentioned, the Reform Party is basically a populist party. That was from the 1990s. And uh, it, it's always around 20%. It's been 20% of the population, roughly speaking, since uh, you know whenever the 1960s, when many of the institutions came under stress for various reasons. And I think it's kind of always been there. And so uh, it, it's just that it co-opted some one of the major parties, starting probably with, in the Obama administration as a reaction to the first African-American president when the Tea Party arose, which is also a pseudo-populist or populist thing, and hijacked basically the Republican Party, is how I see it. So I, I wouldn't say that populism is not newer. It's probably newer in many of these countries that have not experienced democracy for very long, or regions, and that's, it's pro so it's probably the opposite of that. That it's really, it's since the 2000s or so, when the uh, decade after the fall of communism is worn off and the EU is strengthened at the same time, the EU was strengthened at the same time that the, that the uh, in the 90s, that communism was declining or declining. Yeah. Just one little point that, I mean, yeah, populism actually, it has roots in. in all the way back in the 19th century America, the know-nothings and so forth. In fact, I think we're actually the ones who came up with the term first. <laughs> the, us in a political movement in Russia in the 19th century. So yeah, it's got a long, long history of, of, of in the United, uh, United States. I think we've seen a lot in America, especially with our current president, the fear mongering surrounding immigrants and the idea that they're sending their worst people and we have to be afraid of them. Do you see that in Europe and the um, especially in Germany as well? Um, no. Um, I think that um, the immigrants uh, will uh, be a very valuable um, contribution uh, to German society. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying that they won't. I'm asking if your um, leaders are projecting the image of fear. They're, they're portraying it. Yeah. Well, certainly. AFD is exactly portraying that. They're picking on the few you know, criminals that are, that are there and uh, want to generalize that and kind of uh, uh, tell Germans that um, you know all 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 foreigners are, are bad, or at least all, all Muslims are bad, and uh, should not be let into the country. So, what type of uh, my question is? It seems to me that our two-party system, how we set up our electoral college, 